This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. Even as millions of Americans feel beaten up and robbed by storms, many do not know extreme spring weather may be part of the climate crisis. Is that because of scientific caution or is it a breakdown in critical information? And what if even experts can feel shut out? Welcome to the complex world. Trained in the South, American meteorologist Richard Rood bridges that gap between weather and climate. Richard teaches master's level postgrads while a professor of climate research at the University of Michigan. Dr. Rood is author or co-author of over 100 peer-reviewed papers and the book Demystifying Climate Models, A User's Guide to Earth Systems Models. He also publishes articles at The Conversation. From Colorado, Richard Rood, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thank you for asking me. Speaking about recent extremes in storms and flooding in mid to eastern America, you told USA Today it is extraordinarily unlikely that this is just a set of typical weather events that just happens to occur at the same time. What leads you to that conclusion? If you look at the most robust expectations of climate change is that the the temperature will rise on average. And with that temperature rise, there will be an increase of water vapor in the atmosphere. And what people need to understand about water vapor is that it represents energy at some level. It's the energy to evaporate it. And when it changes from vapor back to rain or snow, it releases energy. So we're putting a lot of energy into the atmosphere, and that energy has to have an effect in some way or another. It's extraordinarily difficult to imagine any way that such energy uh, would not have an effect on, on weather. So when you have this background of more moisture and more heat, um, you would expect to see large accumulations of effects, such as spring coming earlier, you would expect to see sort of regional scale events. You would not just be looking at one event that had extreme precipitation, but you would be seeing a larger and larger percentage of the events having extreme precipitation. So if you look at the precipitation in the United States alone in the last year or so, it's been an extraordinarily wet year. If you look at the floods right now, we've had flooding from you know Texas up through the Red River of the North, and we're currently having record flooding in the Great Lakes. At the same time, we just had this extraordinary heat wave in Georgia and in the, in the southeast, which is under also a, a growing drought all of a sudden. So when you start looking at the the coherence and the convergence of all this information together, that's why you can come to this conclusion that this is not just an extraordinary coincidence. And then to extend that, look around the world at what's happening and at flooding in other places. And the multitude of tornadoes in the recent U.S. string of storms is really shocking. And since the year 2000, Earth is seeing a new pattern in tornadoes not seen since 1960. You know, a single tornado may not be record-setting. We may still get several years between the big number tornadoes, but clustered outbreaks of tornadoes may be another unexpected side effect of global warming, some scientists say. What do you think, Richard? When I think about tornadoes, tornadoes are are an event that's very small scale, and there's a, you know, a, a number of things that happen that have to come together in order to get the exact environment in which a tornado occurs. And it's very small scale, and, and the connections to climate would be indirect, let's say. If you look at one of the ways that Steve Schneider used to talk about how to think about climate knowledge and the state of the knowledge he and Richard Moss broke that into four types, well-established, established but incomplete. There are competing explanations, or it remains speculative. And I would have to say that with regard to tornadoes and climate change, we're somewhere down there between speculative and their competing explanations. We have pretty strong evidence at this point point 
that in recent years we have seen changes in characteristics of tornadoes. We've seen these clusters, the, the numbers of them. But if you imagine the environment in which tornadoes could occur, which climate change, um, there are some aspects of climate change which would, would perhaps make that environment more ripe, such as the heat, the moisture increases I mentioned earlier, but there are other aspects such as how the wind varies with altitude that climate change might um, make less likely for a particular type of tornadoes. But if you think of that environment and you think of tornadoes, the real thing that's trying to happen here, which is the atmosphere is trying to deal with energy imbalances, then what you will see is even if you're at tornadoes, the tornadoes, there could be large swarms of small tornadoes. There can be very large, intense tornadoes with very high winds, or there could be some type of tornado that has a larger spatial scale and perhaps somewhat smaller wind, and they're all ways of dealing with these energy imbalances. And I think what we can start to say right now is we're seeing some differences in the characteristics of tornadoes than we've seen in the past. One of those is potentially this clustering, but I think more to the point for climate change, there's some evidence that what we've traditionally talked about as Tornado Alley might be migrating a little bit more to the east and the more tornadoes potentially in the south. And that sort of change in the positioning is more directly related to large-scale circulations that you might associate with climate change. So I think it's very hard to come up with cause and effect. However, I think one would expect that the characteristics of tornadoes would change, and I think it's reasonable to say that we might be seeing that at this point. It seems to me, though, that these unexpected results of a heating planet seem to pop up sooner than those events that uh, scientists could be confident in with easy-to-prove climate causes. Uh, a recent EcoShock guest provided another one. Even when heat records are not set, back-to-back heat waves are increasing in the instrumental record since the year 2000. So these sideways impacts say that climate change is not easy for most of us to grasp. Richard, is it easier for you? Well, I, I've been immersed in it for some time, and I live and, and think about the complexity of climate change and perhaps how to communicate it more effectively. Is it easy? Um, no. Um, part of the reasons it's not easy to explain and part of the reasons that it's you know a challenge um, in the scientific community is that there are a lot of apparent contradictions. But when you think about the communication of climate change, it would be far easier if there was, say, one record extreme set after another, which is not the case, and we shouldn't expect that to be the case. What we're expecting to see is that if you take a population or if you take a series of events, that there are more events that are extreme in some way or another. So you mentioned heat waves. So we would expect to see that there would be more heat waves. We would not necessarily expect to see that each heat wave is more intense by some measure than the past one. So I think one of the real problems that climate scientists have faced, and as well as those who try to communicate climate science, is that the basic physics is really fairly simple, uh, energy balance physics. It's in a very complex system. And communication-wise, we often think to find really simple, perhaps metaphors or similes to explain these things. And while they are useful, they're all limited because we continue to avoid the complexity. So I think the sort of the, the sweet spot is to think about how do you communicate that complexity um, in such a way that, that it's meaningful, but not oversimplify it into a black and white sort of picture, which is not at all uh, what we have here.
Richard Rood, you've written about climate models. Do weather models and climate models share a lot, and do they talk to each other? At some level, that's part of my career. I have developed components that are used in both climate and weather models. And one of the interesting things to me as I was working at NASA in the 1990s was that the weather models and the climate models, you know, really are different applications of of the same equations. And they do, let's say, talk to each other, but the field evolved differently. They evolved um, with different purposes in mind. And so naturally, they each develop their own approaches and their own cultures. But there is, I think, one very important difference between climate and weather models, which is uh, a weather model is trying to take an observed state of the atmosphere and the ocean and the land and project that forward in a way that is rather immediately useful, whereas a climate model is responding more to changes in the environment, such as the increasing CO2 and perhaps changes in the land surface as we alter forests and agricultural fields. So their their purpose was different. And the way I like to think about this problem, there, there are some very important gaps right now between weather and climate science. And the way I view those gaps is that they are giving us information about the physics that we need to understand better. And I think a lot of that is, in fact, going on right now. For a couple of decades, meteorologists and climate scientists barely spoke. There was almost a competition for funding and attention. Did we make a fundamental mistake early on by so thoroughly separating meteorology and climate science? I think that's a really interesting historical and perhaps philosophical question. If you go back and look at the history, and and a history that I would recommend is actually by my colleague Paul Edwards, um, who is a historian of weather and climate science. One of the things that you see is that meteorology had direct commercial applications, And because of that, because of European colonialism, the need to know about states of the weather at sea for commerce, um, there was a lot of attention placed in meteorology and, and prediction. And as early as the 20th century, we were trying to do numerical modeling to do prediction. And at the same time, if you look at the history where climate emerged, um, it was often gentlemen scientists at some level who were going to try to understand the glaciers and making great expeditions to extreme parts of the world in the tropics and the poles. So I don't think you can say there was an intent and a mistake. Um, I think that what you saw is sort of a natural evolution. World War II, and obviously World War I, but World War II because we were beginning to advance more in our understanding of of the numerical approaches, Um, World War II was a huge advance in weather modeling because of the immediate need of it for, um, obviously, combat operations. And so there there are a lot of things that drive forward weather modeling. Um, It was not until we really started thinking seriously about the role of climate change, that climate you know, moved out of sort of that curiosity of, of the casual science and started to move into it having societal relevance and there being a use, and we might have this use-driven research. So we evolved in the 60s and 70s to have the ocean oceanographers part of it, the climatologists part of it, the glaciologists part of it. They all had different fields, different funding, and it's a rather natural attribute of of how these fields emerge out of, you know, this historical context that they compete um, for funding because there's limited funding that's shared amongst the natural sciences. So I don't think it's right to say there was an actual mistake, but it's been extraordinarily difficult to break down the stovepipes 
and to move into what we would call multidisciplinary modeling or integrative modeling or comprehensive modeling. And part of that is, is this history. Um, it, it's really interesting to think about how, you know, meteorology essentially defined the definition of climate for a long time as 30-year average of weather. And when you start to really think about climate, that's not even an especially good definition of climate because climate is really more about the ocean and the ice state. So there, there are big sort of cultural artifacts, I would call them, that, that come from this history. Well, plus, we can't really call climate a 30-year history of weather when the history of weather is changing so rapidly. We, we, we don't have a normal to balance that. But that's another whole topic. I have to get this in. This is Radio Ecoshock. I'm Alex Smith. My guest is scientist Richard Rood, a veteran meteorologist and climate tracker from the University of Michigan. So, Richard, you thought I might balk at your specialty of climate informatics. We will dive into that deep end. It might be foolhardy. But what I'm getting from this is that the satellites and the great models are churning out data and reports, vast amounts of it about the world. And some of that data flow and the models attempt to be transparent. They try to offer access to the public. How is that working out? It's another, I guess, you know, issue of complexity at, at some level or another of how it's working out. I think that you can make an argument that climate science and to the same sort of argument, weather science, because of its strong societal need and the potential impacts that might come from the science on society, has made an effort to be transparent and to make data and to make information available. And if we look at the digital information associated with that, huge portions of both the observational and the simulation databases are formally publicly available. You can find places where, in theory, you can access them. But how to use that data, how to get that data, how to manage that data, how to analyze that data is an enormously difficult problem. When we started this in the, in the mid-1990s, there was this idea that NASA, for example, which had a climate mission called the Earth Observing System that actually was first proposed by the first President Bush, was going to make all of their data available, I think, I was a PI in that program, within 72 hours of the time it being observed. And NASA was taking a lot of data, and they imagined them defining standards and services. And in the mid-'90s, that was not completely crazy. But before you could get agreement on the language, on the standards and services, the technology has changed. And so we got to this point that this idea that the data providers were going to also provide the service to accommodate an incredibly diverse community of users, which each had their own language, they had their own technology, that did not work out so well. And so we started to move to this idea that there needed to be co-development of data systems that considered the specifics of the end users in their design, in their testing. And that idea of co-development and the idea of what actually needs to be in the data system is still something that's emerging right now. You can look and see there, there are a lot of interesting data services out there, but there are some really fundamental challenges with climate data or weather data. One, one is its complexity, but part of it is that it's not static. Um, once you take even an observed data set, there are complex models used in you know, deriving, you know, you can think of how you might measure even sea surface temperature. And, you know, you can probably think of four or five ways that you might measure it if, you know, you were out in a boat and wanted to know the temperature of the water. 
and then you collect all this data, and then you realize that maybe it's, you know, you're collecting data from a different level. You know, you're collecting it one thing, and somebody else is collecting it too, or you might be throwing it off the back of your boat into your engine exhaust or something like that. So you come up with these quality control issues. And so the, the climate data, even once it's taken, is not static. It's always having quality control considerations. And so while it is transparent, it's not always what we would say it's especially usable. It was interesting when we were teaching informatics, again, with my colleague Paul Edwards, who I mentioned earlier as a historian, we actually did surveys of government data systems. And one of the things that we found that was most important for any user was whether it was a glossary of terms that they could actually understand in their field or or in their expertise base of what to do. And then if you start thinking about developing glossaries, and there have been massive efforts to develop glossaries to describe climate models, each modeling group uses the words differently. And it's just an enormous enormously complex task, especially if you imagine a one-size-fits-all for all public and professional use of data. So it's, it's a mixed bag. It's transparent. There's nothing being hidden, but its usability is, is often very low. Well, I'm going to have to wrap this subject up in this way by saying that your book, Demystifying Climate Models, has been opened up as a free electronic book by Springer, and I'll put links to that in my EcoShock blog, and also that listeners, for the meantime, can use earthnullschool.net and climatereanalyzer.org to get at least some close to real-time picture of what's going on on the Earth while we wait for a clearer and more simpler system to be available to us armchair scientists. So, meantime, Richard, you're trained as a meteorologist. Do you keep track of what the American Meteorological Society is saying about the links between climate change and extreme weather? The short answer is yes. I'm I'm a member, uh, an active member of the American Meteorological Society. I was not involved in the rewriting of their draft um, informational statement on the society regularly updates their statements over the years, and they have a new 2019 statement, which is actually quite comprehensive, and and, and it's a nice, clear explanation, I think, of the state of the science in in a limited number of words. So, yes, I do, and I I, um, congratulate and and admire the, the people who put effort into what I think is a very good statement. Yes, I think there's been a lot of progress from that society in the last 10 years of of really getting the climate links in there. Now, this isn't a scientific question, but why do you think the major television networks failed to mention climate change during more than a month and a half of nightly news coverage of flooded farms and towns and storm wreckage? That's an interesting question, of course. I don't know exactly what is in the mind of the news editor and what they're putting out there. I feel as if, you know, at one level, you know, there's a certain demand of the news cycle, and I think actually one of the perhaps even political tactics of what's going on in the United States right now is to create this sort of distracting chaos that keeps people from looking at what's going on under the hood. I think there's also a certain level of climate fatigue in terms of, you know, here's this constant march and, and mantra of, of what's happening with the earth. Thinking about it just from, from my perspective, you know, I, I did an interview a couple of weeks ago with the Wall Street Journal. I, actually far less than some of my colleagues, anytime we do an interview that reaches out of sort of the choir you know, that's interested in in climate change, you know, we get harassing emails. And I'm sure that that ultimately takes a toll on a weather station from their listeners, you know, when they talk about climate change, so that that they get some harassment and and they get tired of it. And, you know, I know a number of TV meteorologists who are very hard working on trying to get climate into their their news stories. 
And I know they receive resistance from some users. They receive support from some users. And I'm pretty certain that they probably also receive some feedback from certain advertisers. So I think I think it's a complex question. And I think there are probably numerous attributes of, of why it might appear to be underreported. And it probably is underreported. You put out an interesting article called Human Experts and the End-to-End System. Can you just give us a nutshell snapshot? What were you trying to say in that article? So that goes back to this idea of, of the data systems and it being open and transparent. And when that was originally posed and these data systems that were going to make data available, and the social scientists I work with call that putting data on the loading dock, Putting it on the loading dock does not mean that somebody can then take that data and turn it into something useful. They need information on how to use that data. They need information on this sort of complete chain of uh, that comes from behavioral science and information science and climate science and then the specialties in which they work, for instance, epidemiology, on how to translate and, and fix that or make that data salient to their problems. And what we found in when we were doing our informatics courses is that it's really beyond what we can do right now to just simply put data on a loading dock and make it available. Go back to that example I gave about you know the sea surface temperature and perhaps the need to be updating that because of collection techniques or analysis techniques or instrument types. And to find that out, you, you need humans. So what we found was that you needed this, what we would call an occupational class of climate interpreters or climate translators who would sit between the data providers and the data users and know some of these um, idiosyncratic issues of suitability for application, quality control, you, you name it. And in fact, you know, you mentioned in the introduction that that I teach these master's level postgraduates. My goal in that program, or our goal in that program, is to be developing these translators and interpreters. And so that's what we were getting at. We are we are not at a place where we can just simply put data out there and expect it to be generally usable. We live directly in the weather day to day. Can we say truthfully that weather is becoming a more scary place because of changes to the atmosphere? I think that we can say that the weather is changing, that in many places, uh, many times, many instances right now, surprises are emerging. We definitely are, are at a time where our infrastructure, our design that we've used in the past, they are being stressed not only by the fact that they're getting, in many cases, old and and cranky on their own, but they're seeing new extremes in precipitation. If you look at urban flooding, um, you look at a place like Ellicott City, Maryland, has had two 500-year floods in the last five years. You look at things like Hurricane Floyd um, in North Carolina in the late 90s and then followed by Matthew and Florence, and you look at Harvey, you look at these storms that have this immense amount of precipitation that's flooding entire states or large subsections of states. I, I think you have to say that the, the weather is changing in a way that in many instances increasing risks and, and it is frightening and I actually occasionally get calls from people who are just simply scared about how to to deal with this and what's coming. I may be one of those people calling you. Sadly, we're out of time for this conversation. We have been speaking with Dr. Richard Root from the University of Michigan, and you can find links to his bioinformation, his science, and his latest article in the conversation in my weekly show blog at ecoshock.org. Richard, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. You're welcome, and thank you for asking me. You're listening to Ecoshock Radio for the world. 
I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org.